This morning we have a, a lesson on miracles and empowerment. And hopefully this will be the final in this series um, on the Godhead that we have been doing. Final meaning for now. Yeah? Next week, Lord willing, we get into a different um, series of lessons, more family-oriented, husbands and wives and children and love and all of that mushy stuff and, you know. But uh, we conclude in this uh, doctrinal section here. Doctrinal lessons are always difficult to preach from the pulpit because... Uh, it requires deeper thinking on the part of listeners. And this, this lesson this morning is particularly challenging. So I'm encouraging you to challenge yourself, yeah? To stay with it. We've tried to simplify what could easily be a three-hour um, three seminar into a 30-minute lesson, yeah? Um, so, you know, some very important matters are there. So, now with that said, we get now into this lesson, the biblical doctrine of miracles and empowerment, all right? The word empowerment means the power that is given, displayed, empowering and the text was read acts chapter 5 verses 12 through to 16 we won't read that again but we jump into the, this matter of miracles the purpose and the intent of miracles there's a there's a reason why your bible is full of miracles from genesis through to revelation Miracles are recorded there. It's an important doctrine, so important that you know the devil is going to be very busy to distort God's divine truth. And that's what makes this lesson so important to you and me this morning. We need to know the truth of God and by knowing it, we are at a place where we will not be led astray by falsehood, yeah? So the purpose of the miracles is well stated for us. We don't have to try to figure it out. It is uh, given to us. Uh, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have a life in his name. That is the reason for the miracles. All right? These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have eternal life. Amen. Yeah? So miracles were designed to make us believe and accept who Jesus Christ is. He is the Lord and Savior of all humankind. Yeah? Now... With that said, we link that also now to this most profound encounter with the, the Apostle Thomas and Jesus a week or two weeks after the resurrection of Christ. John 20 and verse 30 and 31, you know, prior to that, the apostles uh, told Thomas that they had seen the resurrected Christ. Thomas said, no. You guys not going to fool me. I know you guys. You know, you're, you're playing a trick on me. They said, no, we have seen the Lord. And he made this bold and brash statement. I have to see 
the nails in the palm of his hands and the wound in his side. If I don't see that, I won't believe. Well, come Sunday, Jesus turned up. They were meeting and he says, come Thomas, <laughs> you know, examine my palms. Put your hand in this, my side. And Thomas explained, uh, exclaimed rather, John 20, uh, 30, John 20 and verse um, 28, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Now verse 29 is where you and I come into the picture. Verse 29 is addressed to us. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, that is to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Yeah? That's you and me. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Why do we believe? We believe the written record. We believe the word of God as it is recorded in his holy book, the Bible. And Jesus places or uh, pronounces a blessing upon us uh, because we are believers, yeah? So the miracles, again, were designed to make us believe and accept Christ uh, as uh, our Savior. Now, in this matter of miracles, let us understand that a miracle has always been and will always be the working of God. And because a miracle is the working of God, in the broader sense, your entire life is a miracle. <laughs> you, 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 uh, you, you, you. When you consider your life, you woke up this morning. That's a miracle. Why is it a miracle? Because it is an activity of God. You're giving suck to an infant. That's a miracle. And that infant is going to grow into adulthood. You look at that infant as an adult. How do you account for that? Well, unbelievers will say it's a natural process. Well, good people, there is no such thing as natural process. We designate it natural because it has become so common. But when God took dust of the ground, blew his breath on it, and formed Adam, that was not natural. I go further. When your mama was in the hospital or at home and the doctor or the person who delivers babies came by and extracted you with some amount of pain normally from that womb and you came forth and gave that first cry. Ah! That's not natural. That's the working of God. And God has worked so many trillions of different things all across our galaxy that we look at these things and say, that's natural. Because it is so common. But in God's activities with us now, there are times when he's going to intervene into what we consider natural and do extra natural things. Those things we call miracle. So God has always been and will always be a miracle worker. For instance, when we look at the Godhead, what is the Godhead? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
God the Father worked miracles. We, we are only going to take one out, one example. Exodus 16 and verse 4. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Well, you know that for 40 years, God rained bread from heaven. <laughs> Are you with me? For 40 years, you get up in the morning and you simply walked outside and you gathered bread. So Jesus, when he was asked by the disciples to say, asked to teach them to pray, he said, when you pray, pray like this. Give us this day our daily bread. Yeah? Where is that daily bread coming from? From heaven. God provides us with all things yeah, that we need for life and godliness. So God the Father was active in the Old Testament scripture there in Exodus 16 and throughout the Old Testament. Jesus was a miracle worker. We had extensive talk on that in the last two weeks. But we extract from the miracles of Jesus this morning. This one here in John 9 and verse 8. Um, we are the man who was born blind. Went to Jesus. And Jesus healed him. Of his blindness. The Sadducees and the Pharisees heard what happened. They called him and asked him to give an explanation as to how he got his sight. The man answered, John 9 and verse 8. He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. <laughs> you, you know, the, the, the blind man taught a great theological lesson to the religious leaders there. Yeah? He said, a man called Jesus. He called me. Yeah? Made mud. Anointed my eyes and said to me, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. I went, washed, and received my sight. You can't question that. You see, Jesus was a miracle worker. The Holy Spirit worked miracles. We don't often associate miracles with the Holy Spirit, but here is one. In Luke 1 and verse 35, the text says, The angel answered her, that's Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Who worked that miracle? When you eyeball the text, you hear you see what it says? Yeah? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. Okay? Now I know that is maybe new material for many here, so just allow that to percolate in your mind for some time, and over the next couple of years, as you reflect on it, it will gather some depth and awesomeness, yeah? But in the matter of miracles as we continue, we see therefore that the Godhead has always been and will always be a God of miracles. And then now, alongside with miracles for our lesson, we have attached the word empowerment. Can you say empowerment? Empowerment. Yeah? That is receiving power to do the miraculous. 
<laughs> Work with me, yeah? The apostles were empowered to work miracles. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said to the apostles, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Apostolic power is the empowerment they received from the Holy Spirit. You will receive power. I keep repeating that because good people, when it comes to the miracles in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, the works carried out by the apostles, the key and the operative term is the word what? Power. Power is the ability to do. When you don't have the ability to do, you are described as being powerless. When you can do it, you are described as being powerful. Amen? Amen. So the apostles were empowered to work miracles. In Acts chapter 5 now, that's our lesson text. As the apostles from the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they were the only ones going through Jerusalem working miracles. You have the summary text in chapter 5 verses 12 through to 16, which says, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes, both men and women, saw that. They even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and uh, mats uh, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Who carried out these miracles? The apostles. Why were they able to carry out those miracles? Because in Acts chapter 2, at the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they received the power to do such things. Now, so up until Acts chapter 5, only the apostles, that is only the twelve, were performing miracles. That is going to change. In chapter 6. And the occasion that brought that about is recorded for us beginning at verse 1. The text says, Now in those days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. 
These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. That's the key verse right there. These seven men, full of the Holy Spirit now, mature, yeah? They presented them to the apostles and says, put these men in charge of this ministry. And uh, the apostles set them apart. Yeah? Verse number six. These they set before the apostles. And what did the apostles do? They prayed and laid their hands on them. The laying on of the apostles' hands on these Christians made all the difference. And that will be the sequence of events that will enable miracles to be performed by anyone who was not an apostle. Yeah? So we say that that was the empowerment or the miraculous endowing to first century Christians. How did it come about? The apostles ordained them. That is, prayed over them and laid their hands on them. Now, having done that, you remember the first name of the seven the first name of the seven was um, Stephen. Huh? Well, bless his heart, Stephen. Stephen was a great preacher. But he only preached one sermon. <laughs> Are you with me? Stephen was such a powerful preacher that he preached one and only one sermon and that one sermon is going to impact the course of the world that is, will bring about the spread of Christianity from Jerusalem to the rest of the world. Well, what happened? Well, you see that, that is recorded for you in Acts chapter 7. The Sanhedrin takes him, he preaches to them and they kill him. They murder him. And who was in charge of that murdering? Saul. <laughs> Are you with me? No then. We're not getting into that part of it. But no. Go to chapter 8. The next name among the seven after Philip, after Stephen, was Philip. So for Acts 8 and verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Why were they scattered? Because at the death of Stephen, Paul, who was one of the leading members of the Jewish council at the time, embarked upon persecuting, a mission to persecute, really, to stamp out Christianity. So he went, all men and women, brothers and sisters in Christ, some he put to death, others he put in prison. And then he decides that he's going to go to um, Damascus, yeah, to carry out that work. So that is where Acts 8 and verse 4 begins this section here. Those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. The word sign is just another word for miracles. Yeah? For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Yeah? Now those miracles were carried out by whom? By Philip. Why was Philip able to carry out miracles? Because the apostles had laid their hands on him. Yeah? 
So that's the point we make here. Some Christians were empowered to work miracles. However, it required the laying on of an apostle's hands on that Christian. Yeah? The empowering of the apostles gave the Christian the power to carry out a miracle. However, there's a limitation. That Christian who was empowered by the apostles through the laying out of the hands, that Christian could not pass on that gift to anyone. You follow the trend there? Yeah? If the apostles laid their hands on you, you would get the miraculous power to carry out miracles. But the, as you carried out miracles, now people listen to you and all of that, but you could not Pass that miraculous power to anyone. Okay? If you want it done, you have to go find an apostle. Yeah? So the receiving Christian could not pass on or share his or her gift um, to another person. So, that being the case, now remember Philip is in Samaria. Pick up the story with Philip and Samaria. Verse number 14, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then, do you see verse 17 there? Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. The laying on of the apostles' hands in this text here is termed that the recipients received the Holy Spirit. That is receiving the miraculous endowment of the Holy Spirit. Yeah? So, there was in Samaria a magician. Yeah? Name was Simon. The text said uh, he had a big reputation in the city. Yeah? He made a lot of money from that city, fooling the people with his magic. And he was converted at the preaching of uh, Philip. Now, Acts 8 and verse 18 says. Now when Simon, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give me this power so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And as simple as that little verse reads there, so many church leaders have misunderstood it. Sometimes a, a simple thing becomes difficult for some people, yeah? What is it that Simon saw? The text tells you. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. What was he offering them money to get? The power, not the Holy Spirit. He wanted the power. Or let's rephrase that. He wanted apostolic power. That on whoever he laid his hands, the recipients would receive miraculous gift. Yeah? He yeah, offered them money. That was his history. He was an American. You get everything by money. That's where you should laugh, okay? But. <laughs> So, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's a little late, but I'll take it, yeah? 
But Peter, Acts 8, 20, Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. All right? So we, we, have, we are journeyed along now. The Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they have always and will always work miracles. Why? Because that's what God does. A miracle is the working of God in human affairs. Actually, in, in, in our affairs, whether human or non-human, yeah? Now, God now, temporarily, gave miraculous power to his apostles. And the temporary, the apostles were able to pass on to Christians, not all, some Christians, yeah? Some kind of miraculous gift. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 4 tells us, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Yeah? Go on. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same spirit. Yeah? To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So, in the first century church, you know, like the church in Corinth, the church in Corinth, it was full of Christians who had miraculous abilities, yeah? And from the church in Corinth, we learn that possessing a miraculous ability did not make you a mature Christian. In fact, from the church in Corinth, we learn that having these miraculous powers is more of a hindrance than it is a help. Because the church in Corinth is a church spoken against by all, throughout all the centuries, with the question, what kind of Christians were those? Because the kind of evil that was rampant in the congregation was not common to most other congregations. And yet, that is a church with the most miraculous gifts. Yeah? But we go on. So we learn a lot from the church in Corinth. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us also about another gift, a miraculous gift. It's a gift of love. And the text says we are to desire the better gift. That's love. And verse 8, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So there we are told that the miraculous gifts of the first century is going to come to a close. Yeah? When the perfect comes, it's a perfect thing. Okay? And the perfect came. When the perfect comes, he said, the partial will be ended. What are the partial? The miraculous gifts. That will come to an end. Okay? And your Bible goes on to show now that the partial ended. Why? Because the perfect came. What is the perfect thing? The book of God in which is recorded. 
all that we need to know, plus more, to, mean, to have, to begin, to maintain, and to sustain a fantastic relationship of salvation with our God and Savior uh, through Jesus Christ. Yeah? So, the Godhead and miracles. You see the three? Uh, they are they are wonderful, yeah? From creation to the cross, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are very active with miraculous deeds. And then from the cross to the establishment of the church, we have God the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ being proactive in the miraculous. And then from the church to us Christians. Yeah? God is still active, but in different ways. In all of these three phases, phases God is actively involved in the life of the church and in the life of Christians. And that activity in our lives, for the most part, we brand it the name what? The word what? Miracles. Okay? So there is a punchline coming up which you may find surprising now. We know that uh, coming to the close of the first century, the miraculous endowment ended. So that's how we conclude now. Give me five minutes here. Maybe seven, okay? At the end of... Oh, okay, five, okay. <laughs> right. So what we are looking at here now is the pre and we are looking at what happens in the era of the pre and modern day Christians. Pre-modern. Okay, the pre is attached to modern. We are in, this is the modern age. Well, before the modern age, I called it the pre-modern. Are we together? Yeah? So, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit continued to work miracles, but outside of human instrumentality. The notion of human instrumentality is tremendously important for you to understand God's working with miracles. Just as how you need to understand the matter of power. You will receive power. Yeah? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When you remove that power. It is not that miracles cease. Rather what it is. Is that miracles Stop happening as a result of a human being laying hands on another human being. Are you with me? There is no human instrumentality in God's working. So because we don't see that, we don't speak of it. So let's go on further. What is the point? God continues to work. Here's what Jesus said. John 5 and verse 17. My father is working until now and I am working. So God doesn't stop working. The only question is what? How? Can you say how? <laughs> yeah? So the Christian's empowerment in our age... We are empowered, but our empowerment is different from the empowering of the apostles and first century and the first century Christians. What is our empowerment? Prayer and fasting. You get that? Prayer and fasting. Here is a case in point. Mark chapter 9. Jesus had given the apostles the power to go cast out demons, heal the sick, and do miraculous deeds. Yeah? And they went out and they rejoiced. They said, man, even the devils 
are submissive to us. But there is one case. There's a man who brought his son. Think he was demon possessed and they couldn't cast the demon out of that fellow. So G Jesus, of course, chastised them, oh, ye of little faith, and so on. And then he healed the young man. But then here is the punchline for our lesson. Mark 9, 29. He said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but by what? Prayer. Now remember, he had given the apostles apostolic power. They were healing the sick, raising them. Uh, uh, what you call it here, opening the eyes of the blind, giving ears to the deaf, casting out some demons and all of that. But Jesus, they come with this case, and Jesus says, no, this kind here, what is needed for this kind is prayer. That's what we have. <laughs> Are you with me? This is a moment for you to say, huh? Yeah, this is one of those moments. The power of prayer. Yeah, this time goes out only by prayer and fasting. Matthew 17 and verse 21. So, with this now, when we are reading the New Testament, we can begin to take a, an additional or a different look on what the text says about prayer. Because that's where we are empowered. Luke 2.36 tells us about Anna. The daughter of Phanuel, tribe of Asher. She was a widow. She did not depart from the temple. Worshipping with fasting and prayer night and day. What made this widow famous? She lived in the temple... And she spent her days and night in what? <clears throat> Fasting and prayer. So here is Paul. Acts 14, 23. When they had reached, or rather, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. Encouraging them to continue in the faith. And saying that tr through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. You see the point there now? Prayer and fasting. You know, there's a text that is going to tell us to what? Pray without ceasing. Why are we instructed to pray without ceasing? That's our empowerment. <laughs> you're, you're, not, you're not talking with me, eh? That's our empowerment. We have been treating prayer too lightly. We want lightning and thundering and mountains to shake and move, but not realizing that we have within our own individual grasp far greater power. The power of prayer. You know, from time to time, we give God the glory about prayers answered. We have had so many great prayers answered in this congregation that now we take it for granted. <laughs> you, 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 you with me? We now take it for granted. Where is Andrew? Andrew is not here this morning. Yeah, Andrew came to my office last week and, you know, he was out of a job and we talk about some job uh, situation. In fact, he were here Sunday. We mentioned it, you know. Um, and then he came and really, he says, pray for me. So we prayed for, had a private prayer for Andrew. Thursday night, he, in our prayer meeting, he says, uh, I want to thank God for a fantastic job that I have. <laughs> I know I feel. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like that. Are you with me? We just simply say that we have been empowered by our God for God to carry out his work. That's why we pray for the sick. Don't let anyone deceive you that you need to call somebody to come and anoint the sick with oil and, you know, dance around them and, you know, you write them a check and they'll get better. Are you working with me, for people? I'm mean, simply saying, yeah, God has empowered us. Prayer and fasting. No. Because prayer is so crucial, we need to take now seriously John 9 and verse 31. What does that say? God does not hear the prayers of sinners. That's an alien sinner. If you're outside of the body of Christ, your prayers, it may make you feel good. But it is like Cornelius. It just goes up and it stack up outside here. But God is not attending to it. Why? For your prayers to be answered. For your prayers to get the attention of God, you yourself need to be in a right relationship with God. You have to be a Christian, a faithful Christian. Yeah? Dedicated your life to Christ Jesus, washed in his blood, a member of his body, his church, and you are serving him in the best way that you can according to his word. Okay? And that's the truth of God. I've seen many people have shared this passage with them. John 9, 31. They say, I don't believe that. I say, can you read? Read it for me. What does it say? But I still don't believe that. You see, you don't want to believe it. The easier part, good people, obey the gospel. Get your soul washed in the blood of Christ. That all barriers are broken down. And the way is open. That God will listen to your prayers as he stated in Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2. Yeah? So, obey the gospel and be saved. Yeah? So that's our <clears throat> condensed lesson on the working of God's working of miracles. We saw in the Old Testament... In the New Testament area, in the first century church, and that same God is just as active today as He was in the Old Testament. Are you with me? God does not stop working, God doesn't have a retirement plan. Yeah, He's working, and He's working on our behalf. I like what Peter said. To the Christians when he says stop worrying. He says cast all your cares upon him. Because he cares for you. How do you get your cares to Christ? It's through prayer. Okay. Don't want to preach another lesson. Thank you for being here. Want to encourage you now. What is your status before God? Today is your day to obey the gospel. Come to Jesus and be saved. You believe in him, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him. I believe Jesus Christ is the son of God and obey his command to be baptized that is immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. People, let us start believing what the written word of God says. Acts 22 and verse 16. Why do you wait? Get up and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 1 Peter 3, 21. Baptism which corresponds to this now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Upon the confession that you have made, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I baptize you into the name of the Father and of the Son. stayed a little longer 
under the water there with her than normal, but uh, usually, you, <laughs> she's buried and resurrected, yeah? That's the baptism Jesus commanded, folks. If you were baptized, if you were baptized any other way other than being immersed, complete immersion in water, that baptism is not valid before God Almighty. So let us have a private conversation. Let's talk about it, and we encourage you. Get right with God. For those who obey the gospel and you are lukewarm or you strayed from the faith, rededicate your life to Christ. Yeah? Let's serve God. Let's give him the service that he needs, that he demands. He has been so good to us. Has God been good to you? Amen. Amen. So rededicate your life to Christ. Okay? If you need us to have a private Bible study, we're very happy to accommodate you, whatever is needed. If you want us to pray with you, we are here to do that. The fervent prayers of a righteous man avails much. But don't leave here, and you're not in a right relationship with God. Okay? So let us stand and let us sing. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. All right?